So you want to get blacksmithing. Let's talk about starting out. There's a lot of startup videos, but I'm going to tell you what I know. And you can add it with all the rest. This is Gary Brown, Forging On. Here we go. <clears throat> I was going to tell you how I started and misconceptions I had and some of the problems that I kind of ran across. So let's see how this works out. Now, <clears throat> I've been messing with metal for 30 years and or over 30 years. Uh, welding, fabricating, just heating and bending, torch work, welding work, all that kind of stuff. And 20 years ago, I met a blacksmith and I wanted to try it and I waited, you know, 16 years or something um, before I ever went to a blacksmith shop. Now, we're, I'm lucky that within, you know, 20 miles of my house, we have a pretty good blacksmith shop and they have a, their green coal class, which they, which what they call. <clears throat> green coal is your raw coal that comes out of the ground. It's this black, dirty, you get all over everything. And they call that green coal. So that's like not, hasn't been ref refined if you want to use that term. It hasn't been purified down to good coke and all that. So I took the green coal class and it was very beneficial. If you can at all take a class, do so. I watched YouTube videos on uh, blacksmithing for a year or two, I think. And I don't know how many hundreds I watched and I got more confused and I work with metal. So, so, I mean, I have a, my main job, I mean, I, I used to work with metal all the time, but, uh, and welding, but anyway, I'm, it's not my main job anymore, last, close to 27, 8, 28 years, I don't know whatever it's been, um, I've been doing programming, computer programming, so, I decided to go take this class, one day, with somebody telling me the difference of what was going on, and it made everything else, the year worth of videos I watched, kind of click into place. So it's very helpful if you can get with a guild, uh, some people call them guilds, we just call them the blacksmith shop, you know, where I'm at. And go there if you can, or there's, if you can find blacksmiths in your area, a lot of them are willing to take on a student. It may cost you a little bit, um, and take, they'll they'll teach you maybe one or two projects and teach you the basics. And <clears throat> that's kind of what they did in the class when I took it at the club. I was uh, the well uh, the blacksmith shop is they went through and when you take the whole course, you don't use any kind of uh, modern equipment. You can't use power drills or grinders. You have to use um, hacksaws. You have to use you know, files, uh, coal forge, and you have to learn to maintain your coal forge. And that's a full-time job, just about. But it, it really, it, they say when you're blacksmithing with coal forge, half your time is tending the fire. And it's true. But it's a lot of fun to do it, and it's pretty cool. <clears throat> I think um, if you can learn to do that, then switching over to a gas forge is helpful. Now, if you can't use a gas, uh, coal forge where you live, or you can't get coal, some people use charcoal made out of wood. That's all you know. Good too. You just have to adapt this to what you do. I was able to use coal forge there. I bought coal. I made. I actually found at an auction a little rivet forge they call them, which had a little its own crank blower. It's a small forge about that big around. And it has a built-on crank blower. And um, they're on four, four legs, and you could just pick them up, carry them around. And they're, they were used, they call them rivet forges because they were used to heat up rivets during like bridge constructions and stuff. And then they're also just used for uh, general blacksmithing work as well, uh, just doing small items. And I used that for solid for probably three years or more as my only forge in the shop until I finally uh, picked up a used brake drum. And I welded a whole frame around it and, and I uh, put a sheet metal to hold the coal. And just recently, within the past couple of months, I finally bought a gas forge. But I still like the coal forge and I still use it. Um, if you're doing production work and needing to make a lot of stuff, the gas forge comes in awful handy because you can keep several things in there and you won't burn it up. You burn your stuff up so fast in the coal forge, but it teaches you how to 
watch your heat and watch what you're doing and pay attention. So when I started, <clears throat> this is some of the things that I learned right off the bat and I'm gonna try to tell you about them, is I went in with this, I had a set of just cheap ball peen hammers. I had like four different sizes. I think this is the second. This is a 24 ounce. There's one bigger than that around here somewhere. But this is part of the set. And I mean, they're even the ends are falling out. The head's loose. <clears throat> but I took the biggest one and this one, I think. And that's what I started with in my class. And I started in 1st of August, back like four years ago. Um, and in late September, I tried different hammers out at the shop, different style hammers. And I like this particular style. This is a Swedish style. And I invested, and this was like, I don't know, I can't remember, $30 or $40. It's a Pennington uh, Swedish style hammer. This one says it's 100 grams, which is basically two, two pounds. Say 2.1 or something, 2.2, I don't know, whatever 100 grams. You can Google it. 100 grams converts to pounds. <clears throat> and I need to take some of the slick stuff off. That's one of the first things you want to do. If they got varnish, take all that off. It'll tire your hand out and you'll slip. And you want to have it, uh, people kind of flatten these edges with a grinder or something. But, you know, you don't have to do all that right now, but you'll eventually get there. You can index it better when you're like that. <clears throat> but this starting out, you know, you can use a ball peen hammer and get away with a lot. And then I went down to a local flea market and I bought this. I think I paid maybe $3 for this little, uh, I don't even know what the weight is on it, uh, two pound. This is a two pound uh, engineering hammer. And of course it was flat on both ends. And then another blacksmith took, he had a nice um, knife kind of grinding belt. And he took and he rounded one side and then he dressed up the other side and it's all been beat down where it's mushrooming a little bit. I gotta dress this all up again. <clears throat> but you're gonna use the flat of this, the edges, the edge here, top, bottom. On the rounding part, you'll use it. And you move the metal differently with each of these. Or if you want to go and invest in one of these, that's great. I would usually get a little bit better feel from a wooden hammer than a fiberglass, but you know it's whatever you want to get. Uh, even if you went to Harbor Freight and got one, it'd work. You usually you don't want them real, um, real hard edges on there. You kind of want to take a file or sandpaper and grind them down a little bit and make them work. But you're going to use this edge here of the hammer, just like you use a peen. Okay, this is the cross peen. They make a, a vertical peen. I forgot what they call that. Maybe that's what they call it. <clears throat> but one thing you're gonna learn, is if you get in the cold forge, this is some of the, the things I learned right off the bat, is your fire maintenance. So your fire pot, It's not coming out. Let's make it darker. Okay. This is your fire pot. Your air comes up and you have your coal all piled up. Your sweet spot is right in line with this. So when you put your steel in, you want it right in here to heat up. <clears throat> Down here, if you if you angle it down in like this, to where it get, it'll get hot faster, but you're pumping punching all this air in on it, and you're getting way too much oxygen. It over oxidizes. If you're way up here, you're not getting enough heat, and you're it's too cool. This actually acts as the top of an oven. This actually holds the heat in. So this becomes your your sweet spot and your and your hot spot too. So that's the main thing on on your fire that we learned about and you want to keep this and as, as this burns and impurities burn out they call them clinkers they call it uh, you know just trash i mean anything like that but all the impurities that burn out of this will sink to the bottom and they have usually if you buy a store bottle it has a clinker breaker they call it in here to help bust it up so it'll go on down and go into the bucket but um, but a lot of times they get so big, you have to shovel them out because they will rob your heat. I think some even some old timers even call them thieves. 
because they rob your heat. Your heat looks like it's glowing red, you know, almost white hot in there. And you put your piece in there and it barely gets hot. And it's because you got this big clinker or a thief or whatever you want to call it down at the bottom, keeping all the heat. And it's, I mean, it's, it's all in period. It's hard like, you know, steel and glass. I mean, and, that, and you can, and that's why we call them clinkers because you hit metal, you know, like a shovel and it'll clink. Um, another way you can test is when you got coke here, it'll float and then your clinkers will sink. So you can just drop it in the water. If it goes to the bottom, pick it out and throw it away. So that gets into green coal. And this is the part that always confused me versus coke. All right. So your coke, coke is like charcoal or anything like that. Coke is your green coal, which is say you pile your green coal up out here, which is right out of the bag or right out of the ground, however you want to think of it. It's full of impurities and it's green, like terms. So you have to cook it. So you put, you build a fire and you put your green coal and stuff in the fire. This is your first time building one. All you've got is green coal. You build the fire. You might have to use a little wood. A lot of times I just light mine up with a, a ball of newspaper. But you put a little wood in there if you need it for more heat. And then you pile your green coal on there and it'll cook. And you'll see it smoke and smoke just bellowing out. Try not to breathe it. That stuff's nasty. But it'll just be bellowing out. Hopefully it's going up your flue. But it's full of toxins and, and it's all the impurities being burned off. <clears throat> so coke is green coal minus green coal minus uh, the impurities. Can't read that, but minus the impurities, okay? That's coke. It's the same thing with charcoal. Don't use charcoal briquettes, like you know. Kingsford brick, you know, charcoal cube things, whatever they call those. <clears throat> you want hardwood that's been basically blackened. And they, what they do is they, they burn it and get all the impurities out of it. And what they're left is pure carbon. And that's the black, real light lumps. Coke is black, real light. It's almost more it's gray. And all that black stuff comes off on your hands with green coal you won't get it off Coke. It's just like, it almost feels like lava or something, you know what I mean, uh, pumice or something. But it's, it's real light and it will float. Green coal will sink, just like clinkers will. But, um, but when you start, when you're working with your fire, you're going to work with the Coke. So you want to cook your green coal down until you have Coke. Okay, by burning all impurities. And you'll know that once you pile it all up and burn it and it smokes and smokes and smokes and smokes. And as it's smoking and burning, the smoking starts to go away. And next thing you know, you got a nice clean fire. That's just coke burning. And you always want to keep, when you have this area, when you have this area here, is piled up with all your coke in here. You always want to keep a mound of your green coal over to the side. And what happens is this edge of the green coal will sit there and smoke and cook. And as you burn your coke up, you just take and you slice that off and it, let it fall in here. And then you take your hand and you just shove this whole mound over and let it start cooking again. So you're constantly cooking your next batch of coke to keep your fire going. So that's why, you know, uh, fire maintenance is so important when you're blacksmithing. <clears throat> that's a jumbled up mess <laughs> so that's kind of the, the things I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, some of the myths and uh, not myths, but, uh, some of the things that I didn't know I would hear on videos I hear people say oh use coke this coke coal add coke to your coal and I was like what is coke is that a powder I mean I didn't know what it was other than coca-cola or you know the drug coke. So <clears throat> I didn't know what was going on. So um, that was all taught to me in one the first, you know, couple of hours, one hour, two hours. I was at the at the blacksmith shop, and it just like cleared everything up. Get your hammer. Use vice grips if you need to. You'll learn if you go to a good shop, local shop, and and 
join up and go on a regular basis, you'll learn to make your own tongs. You'll learn to make, what we did is we made our little S hooks and we made little drive hooks, which we can go into later. You can always just search that on YouTube. You'll see how to make a million of them. They're simple little things made of like quarter inch steel. Real simple, they teach you how to bend and make little finial curls on the end. Then you moved on and you took a 3 8 inch diameter round rod that was about a foot long and you moved it into, and you had to shape it into a quarter inch square rod, which is a lot skinnier and square, from round to square. And the thing about blacksmithing is you're moving metal. If you tell a fabricator, hey, I want to make, take this 3 8 inch round rod and make a quarter inch uh, you know, square rod out of it, they're going to grind off and you'll have a one foot long piece of quarter inch square, perfectly made exact, you know, because they ground it down exact. If um, you tell a blacksmith to take that three eighths inch round rod and take it down a quarter inch, he's going to move it by drawing it out, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. He's going to move it by drawing it out and you're going to end up, when I did, I took a one, one foot piece and I ended up with, I think it was 27 inches long because you don't, you don't lose the metal, you move it. And so that's what blacksmithing does, is moving the metal. Forging is moving the metal. And they either forge or you bend. So depending on how you hammer around the, around the anvil. So if you're making something and you're, and you're moving the metal, that's forging. If you're hitting between the steel between the anvil, whatever you're using for an anvil, and your hammer, it's going to squish it and do something to it. And that's forging. If you take and hang it over the anvil and you hit it and it bends, or hang it over the, the horn and you bend, that's just bending. You're not forging, you're bending. So the main thing on that here is we always use this cow pile analogy. And so this is your cow pile analogy. If you don't know cow pile, cow manure, big blat of you know liquid cow poop. <clears throat> so this is the forging in a nutshell. So you got a big cow pile there. So if you want to hit it with the hammer, the face of a hammer, that's like taking a, a big flat stone and throwing it in the middle of this cow pile. And what's going to happen is it's going to descend cow manure everywhere, all over you and everything. All right. So if you hit it right in the center, flat, it's just going to go everywhere. <clears throat> but if you do the same cow pile and you throw a log across it from a distance, then all that's going to move this way and this way. And that is the same thing with forging. If you take something and you just hit it that's hot on an anvil with a flat part of your, am your hammer, it's going to go all directions. If you hit it with the peen or anything that's like that, fullers is called the same, it's the same process. There's things called fullers, you'll learn about everything else. But basically it's taking the, the edge and it's this process here of the log and it's only going to go this way and that way. So if you take, let me see here, I don't have a piece of steel over here, but let's we'll say this is a piece of steel. So if you take and you hit this with a peen, it's going to it's going to put a a dent in here and a dent and dent. You just sit there and hit it over and over, and it's going to put dent 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 dent. And if you were measuring it, this thing would start coming out and out and out. Then you hammer it flat. Then you put dents in it. And you hammer it flat. You flip it over, flip it sideways, put dents in it, dents in it, dents in it. That's all drawing out. And you eventually, that's how you take a 3 8 inch round rod and make a quarter inch square rod. You just keep pushing that metal out, 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 out. So that's why you get, you'll, you'll, they call it drawing it out. You're drawing it out. You can do that with fullers and everything. The reason I say you use all parts of the hammer, let me show you this. This hammer might show better. It's a little harder with, with, a, with one of these, but this is just starting out. Getting the feel. You got to get your hammer. You got to just hammer a lot. Even if you get a board and a and a hundred nails and just hammer the nails in, you've got to get that swing motion and hammering down. But anything that's an edge, okay, 
this will draw out if you want to hold it but you're you're working you know it's twisting all sideways so you can hit it this way that edge you can hit this way you can hit this way you could be hitting it this way and drawing it away from you or toward you either way <clears throat> will work one thing i do is i get it hot and i use the flat of my hammer but i put my i put it over my anvil and like this is the top of my anvil i'll take my piece it's red hot and i don't lay it flat because the anvil will suck all the heat out i angle it up like this and then i hit it right here i just keep hitting that same spot right on this edge like out of my anvil and i just work my way up and down flip it 90 degrees work my way up and down flip it then lay it down make it flat Put it back in the fire. Always straighten out your work before you go back in the fire. <clears throat> One time you don't want to do that is if you wait and don't ever hit it when it's no longer red because you'll start cracking it. So that's starting out. And with those basic skills, that's what we that's how we progress. We made the the hooks, the drive hooks, which you can drive into beams and stuff. Um, then we went and drew that metal out, which was basically is this hammer control and getting your technique down and trying to keep consistent. And then the next the next step after that we did was, um, i trying to remember, I think we made a, a punch. So we took a piece of a spring coil off of a car, cut off a chunk, straight, heated it, straightened it out, because that's 5160, it's a high carbon steel, you can make tools out, you can make knives out of it, we use it for tools, and you made your own center punch. And then, uh, we used another piece and we made our own chisel and then we use that chisel. We, we learned how to heat treat it the old fashioned way by getting it hot, non-magnetic, watching the colors, quenching it, then scraping it, watching it, the color come back into where we just scraped it, but it gets a straw color. They call it like a yellow color. Then you quench it again, scrape it, it's going yellow again, quench it again. And then eventually once it's almost all quenched, you're just only doing the end. Your piece may be that long out to here, but you're only doing the end of it. And, uh, cause you want this to stay soft. So you don't ever quench this up here, but you just keep quenching that end. And then when you're done, you just kind of quench the whole thing, get it over with. So you make your own chisel. Then you use your chisel to cut out, um, a piece of metal disc to make a ladle. And then you use the, you also use the chisel to cut your tines to make a fork for hot dog forks. And so then you also use that stuff, those skills to make a uh, fireplace poker and you fold the piece back over and you forge weld it together. And so to make your tip. And so you, you, everything kept progressing on it. So when you're done, you could be out in the middle of a field with nothing but your, you know, source of fire. Hopefully it was coal or, or just, you know, wood turned into charcoal, but you had your source of fire. And you had a hammer and an anvil, whether it's a full-blown anvil, a railroad tire, a railroad iron. I knew a guy that put the plates off of a railroad that came off of an old railroad line, the little plates that go underneath. He, he lined them all up vertically in a five-gallon bucket, set him a big, huge, eight or ten-pound sledgehammer handle on top of that, and then filled the whole thing with concrete so that the hammer head was sticking up. It's just a rounded surface, but that's all you needed to hit with, and you could do all your work. A lot of people take railroad iron, uh, railroad, um, what are they, tracks now, take railroad tracks, they'll cut them up and they'll use them on the top, but if you can get a longer one and turn it on end, that means you have that much more weight to distribute, and you can use parts of the flat and the center and then the bulge for different, different effects when you're hammering, for fullering, which is drawing out, fullering. Fullering is using something to, to do the peen work, and you can use edge for that. So there's lots you can do. So you got fire, keep and maintain your fire. You've got your anvil, your heat, you got your hammer, and now you got all your, your skills on how to heat, treat, make your tools. You start making your tongs. You know, it's the old, the old story goes about, you know, how everybody, you know, everybody had to go to the blacksmith, you know, the carpenters, the, the um, tailors, the, People that, you know, just even the, you know, con masons and bricklayers, everybody had to go get their tools made by the blacksmith. And the blacksmith made their own tools. So that's the starting point. So I hope you enjoyed this. I know it's kind of long. 
Um, but I just kind of wanted to kind of cover everything from, from talking about a little bit about fire maintenance and drawing out using cow pile. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, leave any questions you have below, I'll try to answer them. And if you have any questions or, or doubts like I used to, I, I was struggling with all this stuff just watching YouTube videos. Because uh, once those people would just show you, oh, make this and start doing this. And they didn't tell me the pieces to get to that point. And that's what I'm trying to fill in the gaps here that I had. And so and there's tons of other videos out there, go watch them. Um, and then go out there and light up a fire, put your piece of steel in there. And if you keep your steel good and long, it won't conduct the heat as bad. And so you keep a two foot long piece of three eighths inch, you know, you know, steel rod and make something, just heat the end, make something. If it starts getting warm down there, just dip your end and, you know, the handle end of it in a, a bucket of water and then keep working the, the hot end.